Hello, and welcome to this evening's online event from the British Library, The Beatles in Time. I'm John Fawcett, and I have the privilege of looking after the events programme here at the Library. So we're finally able to present tonight's conversation between Craig Brown and Richard Williams, several months on from the original date last April. That event was due to happen on the 9th of April, which would have been 50 years on from the moment normally considered to be the point when the Beatles, at the height of their fame and their powers, broke up. The British Library has a small but significant relationship with the Beatles. Our Treasures Gallery, which is normally open every day and free to go into, hosts a selection of original handwritten notes by the band, including the lyrics from Help and For Yesterday. These were given to the library and therefore the nation and you all by uh, Beatles biographer Hunter Davis. And now they are as popular in that gallery as the Magna Carta itself. Please do come and have a look once uh, the building is open again. So Craig Brown speaking tonight, he's uh, elevated biographical writing to new heights and his latest book, One, Two, Three, Four, The Beatles in Time, has been widely acclaimed and is newly nominated for the prestigious Bailey Gifford Prize. And that's not the least, I think, because it's found so much fascinating new information, angles and ways to talk about the band who are possibly the most exhaustively covered already in world history. Copies of this book are available to purchase from the British Library online shop. So simply click the books tab at the top of your screen at any time. Also at the top of the screen, you'll select uh, the option to support the work of the British Library or give your feedback on the event or find out more about today's speakers. We'd very much welcome your questions during the event and these can be submitted at any time using the form lower down the screen. We'll put as many as possible across to our speakers during the event. Uh, Craig Brown will be talking tonight to Richard Williams who is a journalist and author who properly deserves the tag legendary, both as a music writer and a sports writer. He was there writing for Melody Maker at the point the Beatles broke up, and he went on to interview uh, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Martin. So he knows the territory. Um, his career spans The Independent, The Guardian, Time Out, Melody Maker, Mojo, and so many more. So you're in great hands. So, uh, and now I will hand over to Richard and do enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everybody and hello to Craig Brown, who's been Britain's foremost newspaper humorist for the past 25 years and unquenchably prolific and infallibly brilliant parodist, satirist, book reviewer and restaurant critic. He is, or was, a contributor to the Mail on Sunday, the Times, the Daily and Sunday Telegraphs, the Guardian, the Independent on Sunday, and Private Eye, where he continues to ventriloquize and lampoon helpless but deserving celebrities on a fortnightly basis. Craig, you were born in May 1957, just six weeks before the 16-year-old John Lennon and the 15-year-old Paul McCartney met at St. Peter's Parish Church Fate at Walton in Liverpool. You were five when Love Me Do came out. By the time you started big school, they'd just broken up. How did the Beatles come into your life and what do they mean to you? I think the uh, my first memory of uh, being a, uh, close to the Beatles is um, when I must have been about 1964, I suppose, uh, Christmas or maybe Christmas 63. But um, my parents uh, for Christmas gave my brothers and me um, Beatles wigs, which were very, I don't know if you ever wore one, but they were very um, <laughs> strong plastic. They were really... Uh, unpleasant to wear, bit into your ears. and um, But so, yeah, so, I mean, I must have known about the Beatles before that, because I, I do remember grown-ups getting very cross about, yeah, 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 about, you know, she loves you, yeah, 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 which I then uh, discovered that Paul McCartney's own father had got cross when it, Paul and John had written, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, can't you say yes, yes, yes. But that seemed to me, uh, it, that seemed to shock grown-ups more than the length of their hair, which has always gone on about. Um, yeah, so then, but I think I only really sort of engaged with them. I obviously sort of knew the, 
I want to hold your hand and she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually it was rather later and with Sergeant Pepper coming out. And I remember my oldest brother saying, this is the greatest record ever made. And I thought that was a completely objective thing, like the fastest runner in the world or something like that. And I remember being really fascinated by that record. And of course it was the only, it was the first record which had all the lyrics on. And so that meant you could read while it was uh, playing. And, and then it had all the bits and pieces inside and that sort of uh, gatefold uh, with the pictures of them in their costumes and also all the people on the cover. So there was sort of uh, lots on offer for what would have been, I suppose, a 10 year old at that time. And so then I really was keen on them and, and got all their albums as they came out and all the singles. And then only sort of later went back to kind of uh, Revolver and uh, the other uh, albums um, and, the, and the early songs. And so in some way, yeah, so I sort of came in mid-period, I suppose, and then and worked my way back. And did they retain a kind of preeminence in your scale of things? Yes, I think they do for most people, especially people who kind of lived through them. They, they, they have this, and that's really the reason I wanted to do them. They have a kind of mesmeric uh, quality, um, which is... I mean, which is slightly to do with ubiquity with pop. You hear, if you've heard Hey Jude, uh, you know, every year, say 15, 20 times a year, just by chance for 50 years, and you've heard it in all varieties of location, then it's bound to sort of mean something uh, to you. And that, but you could say that of quite a few pop songs, but I think that the Beatles stood for something way beyond themselves. And I think that's one of the reasons that people feel very possessive of their version of the Beatles. And people still very, feel very possessive of, uh, of which Beatle is their favourite. You, know, you know, now people in the 60s and 70s still get quite het up about, you know, or whether the Beatles are better than the Rolling Stones, that kind of thing. You, they, they, they become completely part of you. Are you prepared to commit yourself to a favourite Beatle? Um, yeah, I, mine is Paul, who, who's an unfashionable favourite Beatle. Uh, I mean, for a long time, particularly after uh, his death, John seemed to be the sort of one you had to support because he seemed to be, you know, a rebel in the sort of rock and roll way. And he was obviously more spiky and more difficult. And people, I think, resented Paul because he was this sort of showman and seemed to be more keen with his sort of thumbs upping and, and getting on well with people. And, but I, I, first I think he had an amazing um, melodic ability and l lyrical ability actually, if you think of things like She's Leaving Home, Eleanor Rigby. Uh, but also I sort of feel, and you might be in a better position to judge having known them at the time, but I feel that the Beatles would have broken up sooner but for Paul's drive and, and ambition. And I think it was the drive and ambition that the uh, side of the fans resent and maybe that uh, John resented. But I think- you know, I think Paul was the disciplinarian early, early on. I think he, he made sure John's tie was on straight before they went on stage, that kind of thing. But yeah, I feel, yeah. I, I was, a, I was a, a Lennon, you know, if you had to take sides, I was a Lennon person always. But it's been, it's become much easier to admire McCartney, I think, as the years have gone by for the way he's conducted his life, you know. But he, he stays below the radar when he wants to. Um, he's continued to make music. He works hard at it, and that, that's pretty admirable. I, I want also to ask you, oh, if you, if you, um, if you think how many people have gone off the rails with far less fame, far less fortune, far less adulation, um, and he didn't go off the rails, and I, and he still hasn't gone off the rails, and yet he, can, he keeps plugging on. Yeah. Uh, making music, and I think that's admirable. Yeah. I want to ask you a bit about the structure of your book. The subtitle of your last book, The Wonderful Mom, Darling, which was 99 Glimpses of Princess Margaret, gives a clue to the way the new one is organised. It's 150 vignettes or variations on the life of the, Be of the Beatles. 
and it allows you to go off in many different directions and creates a kind of mosaic of their existence from the big picture down to the tiniest and seemingly most trivial detail. What's the authorial advantage of that way of working, that way of constructing the book from your point of view? Well, I think with um, Princess Margaret, it was more obvious in that um, one life, um, fairly static life with a slightly downhill uh, direction to it. But, you know, she, she stayed in one place. She married once. She never owned a house, never moved house, you know. Um, uh, and so it was a kind of voyage round her. You didn't have to obey chronological rules. And I, I, I find with most biographies, which I've read a, a lot because I review a lot of biographies, um, I get kind of bored by the starting with the great great grandparents and moving on and then the birth and then, you know, childhood. And, and there's something uh, also unrealistic about it because if you think of your own life, uh, you know, if you went on a walk this afternoon thinking about your own life, you'd be thinking of things in the future, you'd be thinking of things in the past, you'd be thinking about the present. And, and it is a kind of, it's a bit of a mess when you think about your own life. It's certainly not chronological, it's not, or, or even logical. And so I wanted to um, suggest that, something sort of closer to life as it's lived. And with the Beatles, it was slightly different in that because they had this extraordinary story of kind of rags to riches story of coming from nowhere and the suddenly within a matter of years becoming the four most famous people in the world and so on. You ha I had to convey that and so you have to have some kind of uh, chronological background. Um, but I also wanted to see it from lots of different angles, from my angle, you know, so this bit of autobiography or from the fans angles or from uh, the angles of of uh, these kind of people with walk-on parts, like um, Jimmy Nickel, who became a Beatle when Ringo was ill and was a Beatle for about 10 days, and had the effect that that proximity to the Beatles had on the rest of those people's lives. Um, so, so it's this kind of jigsaw, or as you say, a mosaic. Um, sometimes you create counterfactuals, um, like what would have happened if Paul had failed his, if, if he'd passed his Latin O-level and had gone up a year and perhaps would never have met George or John? Um, what would have happened if his parents haven't fallen into a deep conversation, parents-to-be, uh, yeah. during an air raid in Liverpool? Or what would have happened if Jerry and the pacemakers rather than the Beatles had got lucky and become world dominators? Yes. The, the, that, uh, I mean, it's enormous fun, but isn't there a suggestion in those that actually it was all a bit of a fluke? Um, well, in some ways, I, I think maybe I shouldn't have done the Jerry and the Pacemakers one. It was too sort of jokey at the end. The others, uh, it, was, you know, it was a fluke. It was a fluke that Paul didn't get his right O-levels and so stayed down a year and met George, who was that bit younger than Paul. Um, George wouldn't have become a Beatle. I think you can pretty safely say if, that, if Paul had done better in his, his exam. And so... And of course, Paul, yeah, Paul's parents, <laughs> the Liverpool being uh, subject to an air raid that night meant that the two of them had to, so, so Paul uh, wouldn't have been born or he wouldn't have had the same mother and father. Um, I mean, these, uh, these are true. And I think there is something, I mean, to say that uh, the formation of the uh, Beatles was random and a fluke doesn't take anything away from them. It's just that that's the nature of, of life. And it's, it's extraordinary that these, I mean, what are the chance of these four people in a uh, you know, Northwestern city linking up and suddenly becoming the most famous people in the world and having this amazing effect on the, the rest of the world? Uh, you know, it, it's sort of billions, billions times billion to one, uh, but somehow it happened. Um, yeah. Do you have an explanation for them? An um, explanation for how the Beatles became the Beatles? I think you could have, I mean, the, the, the key relationship in the Beatles is obviously uh, John and Paul uh, and, and the coming together of their entirely different characters and abilities sparked something 
extraordinary. Um, and so I suppose you'd have to send the Beatle uh, any explanation for the Beatles uh, around those those two geniuses. Um, uh, and but then there are there are other bits and pieces like Brian Epstein going down to the cavern that day. You know, Brian Epstein wasn't a pop fan. He he did run a record store, but he, his taste was classical. And he just went into the cavern and was kind of, he said he was appalled by uh, what he heard and saw, the noise and them sort of larking around on stage. Uh, but he also, he noticed something and the fact that he noticed them and then kind of tidied them up, which obviously John uh, resented, certainly resented in retrospect. Um, but he made them, it made it plausible for them to be loved by the world and loved by young girls. and and kind of loved by their parents in a way as well. Uh, and, um, and so I think Brian Epstein is very necessary. George Martin, who I didn't cover enough, I think, in the, in the book, was extremely necessary. Um, but I, th I think it'd be impossible to, to give an overall explanation as to why they, uh, why, what made them uh, the Beatles, what made them so uh, magical. Mm. Their career lasted such a short time and these seven years and there's a very powerful juxtaposition of photographs in your book one of them in 1964 when everything was still fresh and exhilarating and one from 1969 when they look as you write as though they've been crushed by the weight of the world's expectations did you ever get depressed while you were looking through the, all the material about the breakup and watching them change in, in that way? Um, yes, and I remember, I, I'm a friend of uh, Eleanor Braun, uh, who acted with them in Help and was very fond of them. And uh, when she read the book, she said, oh, it just made me so depressed, which I, I hadn't thought. I see it as quite a kind of feel-good book in a way. But she said that... You know, the filming of Help was a very happy affair and everyone got on with the Beatles and it was a very happy kind of crew. The actors and the film crew uh, loved them. But she hadn't realised at that point that the, the weight, as I was saying, that you know, the weight of expectation on them, the weight of... Uh, I mean, she'd obviously knew the fans screaming and that kind of thing, but just how much was expected of them uh, uh, by how many people uh, and the pressure that I, I, I suppose it, it sort of, it came about, I suppose, after Brian Epstein died, though that might've been coincident, but around that time, uh, I think things just did get too much then. And of course they were, um, they were so young. I mean, that's what I, you know, cause I always think of them as older than me. Obviously they are older than me, uh, but you know, the Beatles, when they broke up, uh, I think all of them were under the age of 30. Uh, so, you know, they were kids and, um, and, you know, going back to what we were saying about Paul, that it's amazing that they, they survived at all, really. Uh, given the intensity of the experiences that they'd been through in those seven years, it must have yes, been. Yes, and that's sort of the way they pioneered, you know, I mean, acid and heroin and, you know, they had all the normal kind of drugs, uh, <laughs> drug experiences, but they, you know, they just came, you know, and everyone wanted to be their friend and everyone was using them. I mean, I have quite a lot of the, the sort of charlatans around them. Uh, everyone wanted a bit of them. Um, but I think they were, you know, they were strong characters and they did survive. Did you get a sense that so many things went wrong? Um, Apple, the, you know, the sort of Apple experiment um, with a shop and all kinds of things. Did you get the feeling that this all happened despite their best intentions, that, that their intentions were good at that, at that time. Well, I mean, you'd probably uh, know more about it than me because you were sort of there at that time. But it seemed to me that um, Apple was founded with good intentions. They wanted to give everyone a go. I mean, a kind of generous intentions that they wanted to make it easier for other people than it had been for them. Because, you know, they had, though it was pretty swift their fame they'd, they'd worked hard in uh, hamburg and in liverpool and on tour and you know obscure places um 
And so I think it was generous. But of course, the minute they put an ad in the paper saying, you know, send in your tapes, uh, you know, I think there was a whole room at Apple which just stuffed full of tapes which no one had the time to listen to. And uh, and then the clothes shop, you know, people felt they could just come and help themselves to clothes. And it was all, you know, they weren't, uh, they weren't Brian Epstein, they weren't businessmen. And they didn't really want to be, I mean, Paul was a bit bothered by business, but I think the other, the other three weren't. Bothered. Well, even Brian wasn't that much of a businessman, was he, in, in the end, which was probably a contributory factor. Yeah, no, and um, and actually, I think in I think uh, he seems to have been completely honest. But um, certainly, with the uh, the franchising in uh, America, particularly with probably with the Beatles wigs and things, and he basically sold that for nothing. People were making so much money, but it had never happened before um, a, a pop group being successful on that scale, or even a pop star. Even with Elvis, there hadn't been that much merchandising. Mm. Um, and of course, he was Brian, who I always thought as a child was, you know, he was the sort of straight one with the suit and tie and looked sort of dull and business like. But actually, he was completely out of it a lot of the time um, and suicidal and on uh, took more drugs than any of them. Um, did you did you uh, meet Brian Epstein? No, never. No. Um, as I said, the book comes at the story from all sorts of angles and there's one chapter uh, where you talk about your father and your father-in-law. Um, your father had a bit of a standoff with John and Yoko in a Suffolk pub in 1969 and you quote your father-in-law, the Telegraph journalist Colin Welsh, writing that in the Beatles world certain boring virtues were completely missing. All the military and marital virtues, all fidelity, restraint, thrift, sobriety, taste and discipline, all the virtues associated with work, with the painful acquisition of knowledge, skill and qualifications. All these give place to a decadent self-expression in which nothing is expressed because nothing has been cultivated to be expressed. Did he have a point? Um, well, uh, Colin was an amazing man. I mean, he was guilty of most of the, those vices himself. But because he was guilty of them, he, he really admired. He was basically a bohemian, but he really, uh, you know, he drank too much, he had affairs, etc. cetera. Um, but he, he, didn't, he didn't approve of that. He wanted to be like a proper Daily Telegraph reader, uh, you know, upright and respectable. I think he, I think he had, I can see what he means about the music. I mean, I think there's a bit further on from that where he takes the music more serious. He, he thought that uh, with classical music, you, um, you sort of earn the enjoyment. You know, it, it's, it's harder and so you have to try harder and then and so you dig deeper. And he, so I think his argument, not particularly with, or solely with the Beatles, but with pop music, it was, it was too easy, too instant. Uh, it was kind of instant gratification. And I can see that. I mean, uh, Glenn Gould, who's a kind of probably a trendier figure than my, either my father or my father-in-law, you know, the uh, Canadian sort of slightly jazzy um, uh, pianist, but who did Bach and all the classical. And he, he had real um, musical dislike of the Beatles. He thought he preferred their very, very simple stuff, like She Loves You. He thought everything else was uh, was just pretension thrown a, thrown against this this simplicity, mm -hmm. and so I think I I, mean, I I wanted to give voice to these. Uh, as I was saying, it was this kind of voyage around the Beatles, and I wanted to see them from other angles, including other angles that I uh, might disagree with myself. I also think there is something interesting about the. Uh, my father's born in 1920, so he's 20 years older than. John, which now seems nothing, but of course, when he was 20, uh, he was in Normandy, and so was Colin, actually. Uh, and, and so you can see why they would resent youngsters age 20, just having the kind of time of their lives. And also, and not just having the time of their lives, but seeming to, um, to resent the older generation. So, you know, I, I think those are interesting points of view. I don't particularly 
share that. One of the splendid games you play in the book is to juxtapose the Christmas messages of the Queen and the Beatles, who of course sent, people may remember this, they send every Christmas to members of their fan club a little seven inch flexi disc with a message that they specially recorded, um, which grew weirder and weirder as the years went by, from I guess 63 or four to 68 probably. Um, and you, you compare uh, the Queen's Christmas message in 1968 with its criticism of materialism, um, which to, to the Beatles message and you say in the Queen's message sounds very much like a draft for John Lennon's Imagine. And one of the most entertaining elements of the book, whether one agrees with it or, or not, is the scorn you pour on Yoko Ono and all her works. Uh, the other week on the 80th anniversary of, of Lennon's birth, uh, the Times columnist Melanie Phillips suggested that Imagine, which was probably inspired by Yoko's thinking, was pretty much responsible for the downfall of Western civilization. Uh, do you have any time for that view? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I mean, Melanie Phillips almost, I, I don't, I hate having knee jerk responses. So I, I'm not, I'd guess that I disagreed with her on everything. And if she started agreeing with me, I'd have to uh, move uh, stealthily away from that viewpoint. Um, uh, no, I'm glad you um, you liked the uh, the comparison of the Queen's messages because actually, in some ways, the Queen was doing you know her messages are for love and peace and understanding. Um, uh, well, on the Yoko um, issue, I mean, I imagine isn't my favourite uh, song, but I've got no nothing against it. I, I think it's um, uh, you know it's a, it that's a bit easy the message. Um, and Yoko, uh, I, I've always thought of her as a kind of comical figure. So I hope, um, it, you know, it's slightly sour, my view of her, but I hope it's um, funny as well. I actually, it's the only area of the book where the um, publisher's lawyers told me to tone it down on, um, I think I used the word plagiarism at some point and I had to uh, change it. But I mean, I think certainly as an artist, uh, and and as a musician, uh, you can certainly um, see her antecedents, as it as it were. Do you see any redeeming feature in her at all? Um, well, I quite like the, the kind of just keeping on, keeping on, keeping on. Uh, any other redeeming? No, I mean, I think I think there are quite a lot of uh, features against her. I, I do think that she she uh, that. John had a tendency towards self-pity, uh, which she encouraged. And he had a sense of humour, which she discouraged. And he began to see all the things which he had, he'd rather rejoice, all the nonsense that he'd rather rejoiced in, in the lyrics and you know, like in I Am The Walrus and things. I think she, in some way, convinced him that it was serious or, or at least solemn. She made him solemn in a way. And I think Imagine is, is solemn. And I think um, pop is best when it's not solemn. And I think you, you seem to react very positively to John's enjoyment of Edward Lear and the goons and the sort of surrealist side of, of his early humour. Yes, I think he, he did have this uh, love of the sound of words and, and I mean, like uh, Lewis Carroll, you know, you, you, lots of puns, you know, the, uh, realizing that a word can uh, sound the same. Actually, in, in a way, Yoko should have uh, responded to that because I think, um, I don't speak Japanese myself, but I think it's particularly pun laden language um, because they have fewer syllables or something like that. Um, and uh, yes, and I loved, I loved that early John, which came from, you know, he was doing it as a schoolboy in his schoolboy magazines and things, lots of jokes and puns. And he just, uh, he loved the goons and, and he had sort of real knowledge of them and appreciation of them. And I think, um, I think something was lost when, it, when he started to go po-faced. 
Um, it's a very interesting section of the book, the, the Lennon pun chapter, uh, because it, it appears to, his love of puns appears to say something deeper about his character. Yes, um, I, yeah, I think I sort of, I, I mean, it was in a way, it's the chapter I was um, most pleased with, but, and one of the reasons I was most pleased with it is because it's hard to reduce to, um, to my in, inarticulate uh, chat. But I did think, uh, I think there is something kind of slightly schizophrenic about a pun in that it, it's looking both ways. And I think you, uh, you might be able to relate it back to um, uh, his, his relationship with his mother, which was, uh, she was, well, first she wasn't uh, there most of the time. She was, uh, he was with Aunt Mimi. Uh, and also she was rather kind of flirtatious and, um, and sort of sexual in a way that mothers uh, generally aren't with their uh, sons. And then suddenly she, she um, uh, was run over and died. And so I think there was, there was a lot of kind of muddle there in John and, uh, and in some way the, the nonsense was, uh, was a, a reflection of the muddle, but it was also an escape from the muddle. Mm. I think you make the point very eloquently that John and Paul were in some sense drawn together by the loss of their mothers and that they, it, they used it as a, as, a, as, a, as a weapon in a way sometimes when people said to them, oh, you both lost your mothers. And they kind of put on this rather sorrow, ex exaggeratedly sorrowful air and taking the piss out of people really in, 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 a, in a rather dark way. Yes, and I, I guess they, they, uh, they did it when they were together, but not when they were alone. They, 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 it was sort of, in a way, them against the world. I, can, I, I think there was a, um, an emotional commitment there. They, they wouldn't have expressed it, I don't suppose. And, of course, they both reacted to the, the deaths of their mothers in very differently. Uh, Paul, because he was uh, very close to his mother and his mother was close to him, it was very um, warm uh, family. Uh, in some, though he was younger than Jim was, uh, he was he was less affected by it. I mean, or less broken by it. And John was obviously much more broken by the death of his mother. Um, could I just remind uh, people watching and listening that if if they would like to ask Craig questions, then please. Um, Put them in the uh, the bit of the the form below at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'd be happy to take those. Uh, there are lots of cherishable moments in the book. Um, some quite glancing encounters between the Beatles and other people. I'm thinking of when they met Malcolm Muggeridge in Hamburg very very early on. Um, when Muggeridge was there, was he doing? A TV program or something like that? Uh, no, I think he was. Muggeridge had this amazing ability, which is, a, uh, you know, going back to whether things are fluke or not, but throughout his career, he was always in the right place at the right time and he wasn't making it up, you know. And so, you know, he knew Philby at the time and, so, and that kind of thing. Um, and he, he was, uh, yeah, he was in Hamburg. Walking along, thought he—I uh, he was on some uh, job or other. Um, thought he'd go into this club. There was there were the Beatles playing, you know, with Pete Best rather than Ringo. Um, and of course, the, I think he was probably the first famous person they'd ever met, apart from a few um, singers. Um, and so they were very excited to meet Malcolm Muggeridge. But uh, it's in Malcolm Muggeridge's diaries, uh, which is a rather forgotten book these days. But um, uh, yeah, so that was the first of these odd meetings. But, you know, by uh, sort of by the end of another sort of 12 years, they'd virtually met every famous place, person in the world or every dignitary. Everyone was fighting to, uh, to meet them. What amused me was that they recognised Muggeridge because they'd seen him on the telly yeah, and he yeah. was, didn't recognise them because they weren't famous yet. <laughs> yeah, um, he, said, he said they were like cherubs. He thought they looked like they looked like cherubs, which might be overdoing it. Uh, and their encounters with people who weren't famous 
at the time are, are amusing too. I like very much the fact that when they played their last concert on the roof of the Apple headquarters in Savile Row in 1969, that one of the policemen who went up to the roof to try and get them to stop uh, was, was a, a trainee police constable called Ken Wharf, who later turned up in another incarnation, I think. Yes, he was then um, Lady Dyes. I don't know what he did for Lady Dyes. It was for principal private secretary or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Principal protection uh, officer or something. I think he wasn't protect. Well, perhaps he was protection. I thought he'd moved from the police. But yeah, yeah, you might be. Yes. You know, <laughs> no, there are turn up in the crown. In the <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, but when you when you unearth those connections and fans who bumped into them at various times. What's your favourite one of those? Um, well, I, I like the ones with, uh, I think the old guard, um, I mean, including Elvis as the old guard, but also Frank Sinatra, Noel Coward, uh, them coming to terms, uh, Marlena Dietrich, uh, when they, you know, it, you can see how shocking the Beatles, the, the amazing success of the Beatles must have been to them all, because, you know, Noel Coward, who came from a kind of similar background, certainly to John, it's kind of uh, lower middle class uh, background. And he'd spent all his life trying to be, you know, posh and clipped uh, in order to be successful. And there suddenly you have these boys who are just being themselves and talking in proper you know, Liverpudlian voices and not bothering to change themselves. And then as he would see it, suddenly in those like she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have appalled him, and and I so I, I like uh, I like dealing with all uh, with all those the people who were shocked, including I suppose my father and uh, father-in-law in a on a different um, sphere. Mm. But also, I like the sort of randomers like um, the uh, policeman Eric Clegg, who uh, who killed John's mother. He was off-duty policeman, uh, going too fast. And then this awful story, uh, he, uh, he was put on trial or was at the coroner's court, but was sort of let off, but had to leave the police. And he then became a postman. And I discovered that he'd, one of his jobs as a postman a few years later uh, was to deliver the Beatles fan mail to Paul McCartney's father's house. You know, it was on his round. So every day he'd be lugging these great sacks of mail to the McCartney and dreading uh, that the McCartneys would realise that it was uh, him who'd, who'd killed uh, John's mother. So there are these odd uh, coincidences of, of people, both obscure people and famous people and the Beatles. Mm. Um, anyone who's ever done jury service or done a bit of court reporting knows that every road accident with multiple witnesses always throws up conflicting evidence. No two people ever appear to have seen exactly the same thing. And when you get to the stories of Lennon's alleged assault on the cavern disc jockey Bob Wooler at Paul's 21st birthday party in 1963, or the possibility of John's sexual encounter with Brian Epstein, you solve that by printing all the different accounts do you absolve yourself from all responsibility for settling on one version? Um, well, I think uh, I, you've done more books than I have, but um, uh, all the books you read about, about anyone, they all have different accounts. Even I've just been reading um, Cliff Richards' new autobiography, and a number of places it differs from his previous autobiography which was written only in 2008 so Cliff disagrees with himself you know quite definite things he says one point he says his father beat him once with a ruler and uh, in the new version it's three times with a cane I mean Cliff is an honest person as far as I know uh, but these are just you know your memory plays tricks even when you're trying to make it um, obey you um, and obviously, as a biographer, you can't just go through every sentence saying, well, actually, there are all these alternatives, because um, it would be just uh, tedious. So I did it twice just to show the complications of 
you know, with, with John and Bob Willer, John beat up this uh, disc jockey because the disc jockey suggested he'd had a uh, gay romance with Brian Epstein in Spain. Um, and I don't know, 12 accounts or people at the party um, were entirely different about, well, and some biographers later and uh, um, so forth, but all entirely different about the, uh, the injuries. I mean, some had him almost dying in, in hospital, others saying it was a few bruises and that kind. So you can't, um, you can't tell what's true. I, I mean, so as a rule, and I did this with the uh, Princess Margaret book and the uh, book before, which is about 101 different meetings between people. I just went for what I saw as the most likely rather than the most sort of anecdotal or the, um, because that's all you can do. And I, I think you kind of get a, a feel for what's likely and what's unlikely, but, but no one, I think you couldn't even write a sentence like the cat sat on the mat with, without being, you know, unsure. Uh, yeah. Was it the cat's mat? You know, I don't know. Um, were the two mats, all that kind of thing. The bibliography in the book shows how many other books you read about the Beatles in order to produce your own. Um, and I was amused, given that you wrote recently about Princess Margaret, by your remark that the memoirs of former Beatles office staff share this strange quality of divine omniscience with the memoirs of royal housekeepers and aides. What makes them like that? Um, well, I, uh, yes, they, well, they want to, I mean, actually, I'm very much for, uh, especially the royal family, I'm very much for reading uh, the memoirs of the staff, because, uh, you know, they're usually really poo-pooed, and people say, oh, it's a disgraceful betrayal, and then they try and say it's both a betrayal and made up, and I, I feel a lot of those um, servants' memoirs of the royal family, I mean, going back to Queen Victoria's day, uh, they read true and, you know, but obviously then you get into the Paul Burrell thing of, of writing your second or third <laughs> book about the same subject. And then you can see people straying into, into uh, fantasy. I suppose I meant with the, um, with the office staff, I suppose they then, they become too uh, proprietorial. And so they, they think they know what each Beatle was thinking at any one time. And they do also, uh, they, seem to recall things with um, over ama uh, amazing over accuracy and that you'll have whole streams of dialogue, uh, which they obviously didn't write down at the time. It's composed later, uh, presumably with the help of a ghostwriter. But, uh, but uh, by and large, I wouldn't decry. Uh, I mean, one of the best books, I think, about the Beatles is um, Pete Shotton's book about, uh, Pete Shotton was John's best friend at the school and then and throughout the rest of his life, really. Um, and I think that gives you amazing feel for John as a schoolboy. Or Cynthia Lennon's books are, are, are good. Um, uh, yeah, so, the, so there's lots to be gained from those bystander accounts. Let's have a couple of questions. David uh, says, you haven't mentioned Ringo much, if at all. Um, how does he fit into the reputation and memory of the band? Well, actually, quite a lot of, I haven't mentioned him today at all, I don't think, but, um, but some people thought I mentioned him too much in the book because he's a kind of perfect kind of Dr. Watson figure in the, in the story. You know, he's the sort of, he's the uh, slightly dull, no-nonsense one. But his dullness is is uh, is also honesty sometimes, um, and he could be very funny. Uh, and he was slightly older than them, slightly more experienced. I mean, he, they were very very pleased to get Ringo. He was a bigger star than they were when they uh, got him. Um, and and of course he he had a slightly stuff and nonsense uh, attitude to the to the sort of psychedelia and the Maharishi and. Uh, he was less easily fooled, I suppose. Um, and people, I mean, you, you know much more about uh, the act actual music um, than I do. But people say that because he was a left-handed drummer, that actually his, his, drummer, his drumming was not just kind of steady, but it was also, um, it was very interesting. He made things interesting. And I have seen accounts, I think it was an account by 
by um, the engineer of saying that when the Beatles in the studios, particularly in last, Ringo would drum slightly differently and then some things would fall into place. So I, I think he's not to be underestimated either. No, I think he was a very unorthodox and original drummer. And I can't imagine anyone, uh, any other drummer of the time who would have played the way he did on Ticket to Ride or Rain or uh, several other tracks yeah, from yeah. that time, which were very influential. Which, and it made them sound even more different than, than, than they already were. So I think he was, he was really significant. Um, Pauline asks, what do you think of the Paul is dead theory? <laughs> well, there's probably an overlong uh, chapter about that, because in a way, it, like a lot of things in the book, it's, it's sort of irrelevant to the, the basic story. Um, but I, I do find all conspiracy theories uh, funny, and that one was particularly funny. And also, of course, kind of convincing, you know, in the way that conspiracy theories are. I, I list about, you know, 30 reasons why Paul is definitely dead. It's still going on. I mean, there are still people writing books saying, and I heard someone on the radio the other day uh, saying, well, definitely, you know, Paul, the person who's pretending to be Paul is actually, you know, five inches taller or something. You know, <laughs> people say it very, very definitely. Um, but um, yeah, if, uh, if you're interested, then uh, yeah, the, I think the, the book certainly delivers on the, um, on the, the, the Paul uh, is dead uh, conspiracy theory. I'm sure Paul would agree. Um, a question from Mike Wood. Lenin is deified. Is that because he died young or more due to the cult of personality he developed in his lifetime? What if he'd lived on and Paul had been the one who was murdered? Um, that's interesting. I mean, uh, I think, I mean, just before, in the years before he died, say that, you know, three or four years before he died, his career had slightly gone into the doldrums. He's obviously a kind of big figure, but, you know, he hadn't recorded for a long time. Things he had recorded hadn't been that interesting with Elephant's memory and things. Um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, certainly uh, immediately in 1980, you know, it, it did change the way people saw him. And of course, it's incredibly poignant. And you, it was a time you could suddenly assess uh, his particular genius. And I think um, Paul suffered as a result. People said, oh, you know, Paul's not just alive, but he was nowhere near as good as John and all that kind of thing. Um, if Paul had died, I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's very interesting. I, su I suppose the same would have happened uh, really that people would have um it would have come people would have thought oh well paul was the talented one uh john was the less talented one um and uh yes and and of course you know everything uh, everything is uh seen as potential after if someone's died everything is oh the all the un the un um played records the un written books um and so uh so you know it's it's some ways um it's a gift to uh reputation and an early death um in a you know grotesque way uh, a question from helen what was your most surprising discovery during your research um i i kept uh I kept being surprised by their youth, which I sort of touched on before, but I, I kept thinking, you know, uh, God, George was only 17 when he went to Hamburg. I mean, you know, uh, and, um, you know, his, he, by the time of his 21st birthday, he was uh, one of the foremost people, <laughs> famous people in the world. And, uh, and, and just how, how much, uh, lay on their shoulders and so I think that I mean you'd thought that's hardly a, a discovery because obviously everyone knows their ages but you know as you get older they they get younger bizarrely because you know I just think of myself age 23 and whether I'd you know I wouldn't have been able to do anything hardly um, do up my own shoes um uh the what the other discoveries I liked this one um I discovered there's a uh, John Lennon's tooth. 
this also shows, I mean, by and large, I keep to the, I, I cut off in 1970. However, John Lennon gave his tooth in the mid 60s. He'd had a tooth out, gave it to his uh, housekeeper, whose, uh, whose daughter was a great Beatles fan. So the daughter kept the tooth. And then a few years ago, she uh, put it up for auction and it sold for something like 20,000 pounds to a Canadian dentist who said that he was, <laughs> that he was going to take it round and uh, infuse uh, dental students in Toronto, uh, bring it out at his lectures. And that was, but then it emerged. In fact, uh, he was going to, he had a plan to get the DNA off the tooth and he put advertisements in the papers for anyone who thought that they might be the child of John Lennon. And then they could together sue the Lennon Ono estate. Uh, and so there are these, yeah, so there are these little discoveries I made of these randomers. So even 50 years later, people are still, uh, you know, working out ways of making money off the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, Paula asks, What's your all-time favourite Beatles song? And then she well, Paul, uh, whether whether she just wants a, a Paul song, or perhaps you nominate a Paul song and a song irrespective of that. Um, well, actually, it is a Paul song, and uh, you know, it's it's uh, an obvious one rather than you know. I, I, a little part of me wants to say something like, "Baby, I'm a, a baby, you're a rich man." Um, but it's not. I just have a sort of. I remember sort of discovering it. It was a B side, of, and it, it, you know, it has a sort of bizarre quality for me. However, um, my actual favourite is "Hey Jude." I mean, which I, especially when I was writing the book, but since since writing it, you know, I was playing it almost manically, and I think um, it has some extraordinary quality above and beyond itself, uh, and. Uh, and it's probably a good, you know, particularly for this kind of time. It's a it's a song about consolation, um, and uh, yeah. So the, these uh, this uh, tricky tricky year, I think it's particularly appropriate song, and that's a Paul song. Mm -hmm. Though of course, slightly, he wrote it with uh, John in mind, or with Julian Lennon Julian. in mind. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, John thought that it was John being slightly solipsistic. Thought it was about him rather than, um, uh, rather than about his son. A uh, question from Martina. Do you think Friar Park will ever be open to the public as a museum of some sort? Um, well, I'm afraid that's beyond my level of expertise. Um, <laughs> the, I do have uh, in the book uh, two trips I made to um, John and Paul's houses in Liverpool, which are uh, owned and run by the National Trust. Uh, I had a slight contretemps with the curators there. Um, awesome. <laughs> but, and so, um, I, I mean, if it was opened, I, uh, I mean, I think, find those two houses, the, the houses they were brought up in Liverpool, kind of moving, in fact, you know, the, uh, and I think it's very good the National Trust took them on. However, it's they're moving because of the, the smallness and the, you know, uh, uh, just you, you see what the Beatles came from. But I think with Friars Park, there would be nothing. I think they were selling about uh, three years ago, they were selling the gates or something like that. But there's basically nothing left. So I think it would be bogus. And so if the National Trust took it over, they would then try and recreate, you know, the curtains. <laughs> um, uh, and so it would be it would be artificial. But I'm afraid I can't tell you whether it would be open or not. Uh, and a big question from Sophie. Could it ever happen again, a band as significant as the Beatles? Well, it'd be interesting to know what you think of this. But uh, I, I'd say it couldn't because the world media has just got so uh, out of control and there are so many different um, places to hear. At Th that time, there was only kind of two television stations, uh, one pop music programme, um, you know, there was just one chart. Uh, um, now there's so such infinite variety. Everyone can pursue their own specialization um, that I think it would be very hard for a band to, to grab so many people's um, attention. 
I also slightly suspect, though I've got no proof of this, that they were at the end of the kind of pioneering days of rock music, that it was still kind of being, people were still seeing new horizons in, in pop. And I, I suspect that with just the, with the variety of chords and notes, maybe things have come to a creative end. Now you can, you can do interesting things by combining stuff or that sort of thing. But I suspect though this might just be, you know, side of uh, growing old. I, 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 I sort of think that the, the interesting work in part might, might have already been done. What do you think, Richard? Um, I think history repeats itself, but I, I think it never repeats itself in exactly the same form. So I think something similar could happen, but it won't be the same because the ingredients and the, the foundations can't be the same. Um, but I, I, I see no reason why something musical couldn't, uh, some musical force couldn't have a similar effect sometime in the future, but I can't imagine what on earth it might be. Um, a question from Alistair Foster. <laughs> Is there anything left to be written about the Beatles? I like the way Craig compares and contrasts the different myths and tales from various sources, writers and interviews. Um, well, I'd say that, I mean, there's basically in my book, there's not a, a huge amount that's original. It hasn't been, you know, covered elsewhere. There's not, it's a bit like, um, you know, King Henry VIII or something that, uh, you know, you're not going to discover a seventh wife, but it's unlikely. Um, uh, but I think there's always ways of looking at the Beatles. I mean, it, everyone has their own way of looking at the Beatles. So there could be an infinite number of books to be written about the Beatles. Uh, this is my book, and I've, I hope I've done it in a, a way which suggests that there was a a reason to write it, that it not, well, isn't just kind of act of a kind of copycat act. Um, but I think anyone, you know, who can write uh, could write and had some kind of interest in them, enthusiasm for them or hatred of them, could write their own book about the Beatles. Um, I don't, I certainly, I could, have, I could have written the same length book and my book's quite long, it's sort of 600 and something pages. I could have written the same length using entirely different stories you know i i um there's just a, i mean it's, especially with john i mean in you see i mean when you interviewed him in sort of 1969 kind of area even though he was pretty kind of strung out on drugs and everything i mean almost every day you could turn into a book i mean uh, he was amazingly energetic i mean apart, apart from anything else he wrote these very very long letters and and plenty of letters, you know, he was sort of, uh, and you can't believe that he was, he, he should have been, you know, just lying in a sleeping bag or, uh, you know, doing his baggism all day, but uh, he was giving interviews, he was uh, creating stuff, he was being outrageous, he was being funny, he was, you know, ringing Aunt Mimi, uh, and I, I think you, you could make a, a, a book about, you could pick any day of those sort of 13 years of the Beatles and, um, and make a book out of them. I will say that I suppose I've read my fair share of Beatles books in my time, but I found many new things uh, in your book or many new juxtapositions or things that made me think, uh, made me laugh and at the end um, made me feel very moved, particularly in the final sequence where you do a very daring thing of reversing the story of Brian Epstein. So you begin with his funeral and end with him walking down the steps into the cavern to discover the Beatles, which is, a, 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 I thought, a, an extraordinary thing to do that you bring off brilliantly. Yes, I just, I, I sort of thought of it. Um, there's a very good book called Stuart, A Life Backwards. It's about a uh, Tramp, which does the same thing, does his life in reverse. But I think with, with uh, it, it, the first chapter is the same as the last in my book, and it's, it's uh, Brian going down the steps of the cavern. And for Brian, those sort of 17 steps, I think it's 17, down the cavern was both the beginning of everything, and for Brian Epstein, in a funny way, the end of 
everything at the same time. But he, he, he became the most successful manager in the world. He had this thing that he completely adored, the Beatles. Uh, everything had gone right. He'd managed everything, you know, exact, you know, uh, nothing was left to chance really with him. And yet uh, he hadn't uh, got any kind of happiness or contentment and was just sort of paranoid most of the time. And so, um, yeah, so that was uh, one of the reasons for, for doing it in, in reverse. Well, it's one of the many brilliant things about your book, and we've run out of time, I'm afraid. So thank you, Craig. Thank you to the British Library for setting up this event. And thank you to the audience for listening and for the questions. Um, if you want to buy the book, there you can click on a link to the British Library bookshop, I think. And so with that, thank you and good night. Thanks, Richard.